Hello everyone, thank you for joining me yet again on this evening. We are doing a 9 o'clock in the evening Bible study. And we are studying the book of uh, Philippians now, a detailed study, verse by verse study. And we got to continue from uh, chapter 3 and verse 17. Uh, but for the sake of connection, I'll read two verses that we've already done from this particular section. Firstly, exhortation to a heavenly walk. That's our heading. Chapter 3, verses 15 to 21. Verse 15, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too, God will make it clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. So for the sake of connection, a small inter in the explanation about this is that those of us who are mature and who have grown in, this, in the spirit and spiritually mature should not become complacent. And the God will judge us by the extent of the light that he has given us, understanding of the scriptures that he has given us. And verse 16, we saw that um, it is important for us to look unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And that there are many who have started the race, but have finished very badly. They have started very successfully, but have finished very badly. This is where we stopped yesterday, chapter 3, verse 16. Today we go on to chapter 3 and verse 17. God willing, we will complete chapter 3 today. Verse 17. Join with others in following my example, brothers and sisters, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. So basically, Paul is exhorting the Christians that their lifestyles, the lifestyles they lead, should be models worth following by others. In other words, the way we live should set an example to others so that they can imitate us and they can follow us. And the word example here, join with others in following my example, the Greek word is typos. From that you get the English word type. So the meaning here is impression, figure or image. So we should set an impression on others or we should uh, be the figure or image that other people should follow. So our life should set the standards for others. Sadly, what happens is we allow, sometimes we allow the world to set the standards for us or the spokesman of this world to set the standard for us. But we as Christians should be setting the standard. Verse 18. For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. As we saw earlier, this is an epistle of joy. But in the midst of the epistle of joy, Paul is shedding tears. Yet he is not shedding tears for himself. But he is weeping for those men. Uh, he is weeping because of the harm those, some of those people are doing to the churches of God. Even today we have many false prophets and false teachers and uh, just professing Christians who are doing a lot of damage to the body of Christ. And we need to weep when we think of them. And he goes on to explain or describe them in uh, four ways in verse 19. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Now this best describes cult leaders. And we have many of them even today. And uh, <clears throat> first thing about them you notice is their destiny is destruction. Which means that even today, or rather in today's world, they may be very successful, very flamboyant, very charismatic, very, uh, uh, very well dressed, and maybe millionaires. But their end will come, and their end will be their destruction. Because those who teach, uh, uh, who, who are cult leaders or who teach false doctrines, are obviously not believers, and their end will be destruction. And secondly, it says their God is their stomach. You know, what it really means is not just uh, food that goes into the stomach. It denotes extreme self-centeredness, appetites and desires. So these uh, false teachers who were affecting the body of Christ in uh, Philippi, similar to them, you have false teachers even today. And they will emphasize 
on money. They will em emphasize on, on tithing to their ministry or to their church. It's all about money and the whole ministry is built around money. And uh, F.B. Mayer, a great uh, Christian writer says, on this particular verse he says, there is no chapel in their lives, it is all kitchen. I find that humorous, there is no chapel in their lives, it is all kitchen. So what it basically means is, it's all about their lusts, their desires, their ambition and their appetites. Thirdly, firstly, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame. So whatever they do, they think that they are getting glory among men, but in reality, it is a kind of a shameful glory. And he wraps up this verse by saying, their mind is on earthly things. So you shall know the reality of a person's uh, teaching. You will know the reality of a person's uh, doctrine by this last element on what they set their minds on. A true servant of God, a true preacher of God's word, somebody who is called and anointed by God will encourage people to set their minds on things above. And that's the context of this. But those who are false teachers will encourage the people to set their minds on things below, things that are earthly. So their minds, their mind is on earthly things. So these were the people who were known as antinomians or libertines. So they pushed people to look for earthly benefits. Even today, many people preach that if you come to Christ, you will have lots of earthly benefits, which is not something that I see in the scripture, especially in the New Testament, in the church age. Nowhere is health, wealth and prosperity promised to believers. In fact, the only time it is written to the body of Christ about the money, it basically gives the... Uh, uh, impression that we should not be greedy for money but money should be our servant and uh, that that God will look after our needs he will he cares for us he looks after our need but we need to put the kingdom of God first we must focus on those things that are eternal we must focus on those things that are lasting forever and things that are of heaven so he goes on to say in chapter 3 and verse 20 but our citizenship is in heaven. The emphasis is mine, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, our citizenship is in heaven. I know all of us have earthly citizenships and as I look at the names, most of the names that appear here listening to me right now are Sri Lankans and some may have Swiss or uh, British citizenship, but uh, our citizenship, this earthly citizenship is not the real thing. Our citizenship is in heaven. And uh, this is what I explained in the uh, introduction a few nights ago that uh, in the Roman Empire, there were two types of citizenship. There was uh, full citizenship and there was partial citizenship. Full citizens, uh, citizenship gave full rights and so many tax benefits to the citizens and it allowed them to travel freely across the Roman Empire. And Paul had full citizenship and that's, how, that's one of the reasons why God chose him because he was free to travel across the empire in order to preach the gospel. So full citizenship was given to citizens of the lands or cities or countries under the Roman Empire which were very important, very prominent. Like if you lived in Rome or in Alexandria or in, uh, in Tarsus or in Antioch or in Philippi or Ephesus, you were given full citizenship because these were important centers, important cities. But if you had lived in Jerusalem, it was considered to be a backwater. If you had lived in Nazareth or in Bethlehem or somewhere, you would not have had a full citizenship. If you are a Roman citizen, you would have had a partial citizenship. So in our case, our full citizenship is in heaven. The Philippians understood the value of the Roman citizenship. In the same way, we understand the value of a heavenly citizenship. So we, we are citizens of heaven. We are aliens in this world. We are in the world, the Lord Jesus taught the disciples, but we are not of the world. Hebrews 11, 8 to 10, it speaks about one man who lived a long, long time ago, who lived 4,000 years ago, 
whose who realized that his citizenship was in heaven hebrews 11:8 to 10 by faith abraham when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going by faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country interesting isn't it the promised land was promised to abraham and his descendants but he lived like a stranger in that promised land as if it was a foreign country he lived in tents as did isaac and jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is god this is not our home we are simply passing through this place and our citizenship is in heaven the famous song and i quote many of you know this by heart perhaps this world is not my home i'm just a passing through my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and i can't feel at home in this world anymore so paul reminds the philippians who held the prestigious roman citizenship that their true citizenship is in heaven Moffat calls it we are the colony of heaven we are ambassadors of christ we are citizens of heaven living on earth which is a different land so this is an important aspect that we have to remember if you look at uh, foreigners living in our midst and you notice that they do not give up their culture at home they speak their own language they eat their own food and they dress up in their own uh, Uh, which is culturally relevant in their country in the same manner though we are not really citizens here we are citizens of heaven we must display the characteristics of heaven in our life here we must display christ like characteristics in our life here why the second part of chapter 3 verse 20 of philippians says and we eagerly await a savior from there the lord jesus christ So this very clearly teaches us that the Lord Jesus is today in heaven. Why we are expecting him to come down from heaven. He he entered world he entered the world rather in the womb of a virgin. He was born that's what we call as the incarnation in Bethlehem and then he continued to live as a man whilst being God. He suffered and bled and died for us. He was buried rose again on the third day and he from that point onwards he then he ascended into heaven and now he seated at the right hand of the father so the lord jesus is coming the second coming of our lord jesus christ is the next great event in human history so paul very clearly says and we eagerly await a savior from there the lord jesus christ writing to the thessalonians paul encourages us by saying that there is a crown of recognition for those who eagerly await the coming of the lord jesus christ we must live in the light and the shadow of his second coming without setting our affections on the things of this world we as citizens of heaven our affections must be on eternal things on heavenly things and verse 21 chapter 3 verse 21 of philippians who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lonely bodies so that they will be like his glorious body again a reference to the resurrection of christ and the resurrection of believers this is what is known as the uh, first part of the second coming of christ which we call the rapture the word rapture is not used in the scripture but like the word trinity it is used to explain something the rapture is when the lord jesus will come down in the clouds with the souls and the spirits of the saints and he will resurrect the bodies of the saints from the earth and the bodies and the soul and the spirit will merge together and that is the fulfillment of our redemption so he says he will tra- transform our lowly bodies now what's wrong with our bodies now our bodies are lowly it is a body of uh, humiliation in fact the word lowly in greek is humiliation the body that we have is a body of humiliation in first corinthians 15 paul makes four contrasts between our present bodies and the future resurrection body 
the glorified body or the resurrection body will be perfectly suited for heaven and for eternity. Let me read from 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44. And so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So four elements. Firstly, the body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. So the body that we have now is a perishable body. And uh, that's why it grows old and one day it dies. It stops functioning and life leaves this body. But this same body will be raised up as, perish uh, as imperishable. Like a seed that is sown in, on the ground, our body will also be raised up. But the glorified body, we really don't know what materials will be there. Perhaps God might use different materials to make up for the deficiencies in this body because that body is forever, is for all eternity. Secondly, our body now, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. Every dead body is a reminder of our dishonor. It's a reminder that we are weak and frail, but that body will be raised in glory. Thirdly, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. The resurrection body is not subject to the material forces. The Lord Jesus was able to appear and disappear. He was able to appear inside a locked room. So you see that his body was so powerful and it could, uh, it, it was not subject to material forces or the laws of nature. So and we must remember that the reason why the angel rolled the stone away from his tomb on that Easter morning is to not, not to let him out, but to ensure that the disciples were able to go in. Fourthly, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Doesn't mean that we'll be spirit beings like uh, Casper the friendly ghost. But what it means is it is a body that will be without sin. Remember the resurrection body of Christ could be felt and touched. He even had breakfast with them. He ate with them. So it's a body similar to this, but without being affected by sin. So this is the greatest thing about the resurrection. Going back to Philippians 3.21, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. So here is evidence that the, at the resurrection, at the rapture, each one of us believers will be given a body that will be very much like the body that is occupied by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now always remember, God became human and he will maintain his humanity even though he is God Almighty. He will always maintain his human body. So our, the second person of the Trinity, the Logos, eternal Logos, the word of God will maintain that human body forever and forever. So when we see him in heaven, we'll see him in his uh, human body, unaffected by sin. So we finish this section. So I leave with us a few challenges, five challenges. First one, do you measure your spirituality on external or internal conformity? Remember, the answer should be internal conformity. Do you consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus your Lord. Have you experienced the resurrection power of Christ? How far have you progressed in the Christian race, in the spiritual life? Is your lifestyle a model to be followed by other Christians? So this leads us to the last chapter of Philippians. Let us start off on that. We still have another 10 minutes to go. So this is about joy. Chapter 4 is actually an appeal for harmony, which is coupled with joy. So chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, this is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. An amazing verse. Now, these are not words of flattery, but of sincere love. Similar to the words that Paul uses on the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. 
For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Paul delighted in his brothers and sisters. For him, they were everything to him. He loved them, he delighted in them, and he, he loved to... Uh, he loved to uh, to lead them into Christ, into Christ's salvation. He loved to lead them in their Christian life. He loved to disciple them and loved to mentor them. So you can see the longing heart of a pastor coming out here. You whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, he says. So on the basis of the wonderful hope, that Paul had set before the believers in uh, chapters 2 and 3 of uh, Philippians, he now exhorts them to stand firm in the Lord. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, this is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. So he's telling them to stand firm. And another verse that I often quote, 1 Corinthians 15:58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always make yourselves, uh, pardon me, always uh, make yourselves fully to the, always give yourselves rather, fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So the term uh, stand firm basically is a term that Paul has borrowed from uh, wrestling. And if you have seen uh, Greco-Roman wrestling, you notice how uh, they stand with their feet apart or any, any kind of wrestling, you stand with your feet apart because that lowers your center of gravity. So it's more difficult for your opponent to push you down. So in the same manner, he tells the believers again and again, stand firm. Don't let the enemy push you down. Don't fall on your back. Stand against the enemy and fight the good battle against the enemy. So in our Christian life, the enemy will attack us in so many different ways. He will try to discourage us. He will bring all kinds of uh, impediments on our way. But we are to stand firm in the Lord, not in our own strength, but in the strength that he provides through God, the Holy Spirit, who indwells us. So you can see Paul's heart here. This verse is filled with many endearing terms for the believers. My brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, and my joy and my crown. Just one more thought here is the word crown. The word used here is uh, in Greek, the word Stephanos. There are two Greek words that are translated into English as crown. One is diadema, other one is Stephanos. Diadema, from that you get the English word diadem, is a royal crown. In the book of uh, Revelation, we see three people having crowns, such diadema crowns, the beast, uh, then you have the uh, have Satan or the dragon, and then the Lord Jesus Christ. But this crown is Stephanus crown. It is not a crown of royalty or authority. It is a crown of recognition. This was the crown that was given primarily to athletes, Olympic athletes on their victory or in their, in their success. Uh, it's a crown that was given to people who went beyond the call of duty, people who uh, perhaps did uh, carried out acts of extreme courage like uh, jumping into the water and saving somebody who's drowning or jump, uh, running into a building that's burning and saving people from there. So the Lord has promised us five different Stephanus crowns in the word of God. That's a different study altogether. So for Paul, Philippians are not only his a victory in this life, but also at the judgment seat of Christ. So the people we minister to with the right motives, sacrificially, with love, according to the call of God, in the spirit of God, they are our victory. They are our crown, not only in this life, but also in the life to come at the judgment seat of Christ. And as I've always said, Christianity is not denominations or constitutions or buildings. It is about relationships, our relationship with God and our relationships with fellow human beings. So Christian ministry is all about people, not anything else. So when we invest in the lives of people, when we build them up, nurture them, 
and see them grow in the faith and mature, becoming good and great believers. That would be a victory for us, not only in this life, but also in the life to come. Now we go to chapter 4 and verse 2. I see an element of humor here. I'm sure Paul had a sense of humor, but of course this was a sad and a real situation. He says, I plead with Yodia and I plead with Sintash to agree with each other in the Lord. Now what is interesting and humorous about here is that there are two sisters in the assembly in the church who are having problems. They were having a disagreement and their names actually meant, Yodia meant fragrance. Sintash meant fortunate. So fragrance and fortunate are having problems. Many a time we don't live up to our names. When we are born, our parents, you know, for every parent, their own child is the best thing in the world. They have grand hopes for us and they give us fantastic names and we don't live up to those names. You know, my name, uh, my full name loosely translated means victorious warrior, but I'll be the first to run if a dog chases me. So people don't live up to their names. Fragrance and fortunate were having a big disagreement in the church. But you notice Paul's maturity here. He handles the issue tactfully. Now he doesn't take sides. We don't know who's right, but he doesn't take sides. But he encourages others who are closer to the ground situation, those who are in Philippi, to promote reconciliation. The disagreement most likely or most probably would have been on some uh, church matter of church practice or it would have been of a personal nature. How do we know this? Because if there was a doctrinal disagreement, Paul or theological disagreement, Paul would have somehow addressed it directly in his uh, epistle and he does that in almost all the epistles. So this is more of a practical issue or church practice of a personal nature. So and he goes on to encourage those two ladies uh, that is Yodia and Sintash as well as the other believers in chapter 4 and verse 3. Yes and I ask you loyal yoke fellow keep these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So Iodia and Sintaish were both involved in the ministry. So they were not uh, new believers or they were not people who were on the periphery of the church, but they were very much involved in the ministry. And then he goes on to talk about yoke fellows. You know, he says, yes, and I ask you loyal yoke fellow. It actually means yoke together. Greek uh, writers generally use this uh, particular Greek word for those who are united in the bonds of marriage, relationship, office, labor, study or business. So here these believers are all yoked together. Think of uh, two oxen yoked together in order to pull the plow. They have to work together. In the same manner, he is using the same concept here. We as uh, servants of God, as believers in the same body of Christ, we must be yoked together and we must pull together. Instead of having divisions, we must have unity. And also he talks to them about, uh, he talks to them and refers to them as the rest of my Clement and the rest of my fellow workers. Again, even though Paul was an apostle, He treats all servants of the Lord as equal. Now, over the last 2000 years, we have built up titles and hierarchies in the body of Christ that uh, there are some people who are honored more than others. Some people are more equal than others. But the body of Christ, but the word of God very clearly teaches us that in the body of Christ, all servants of the Lord are equal. And he also speaks about the book of life. And uh, and this is the. Uh, register of those whose citizenship is in heaven. If you look at 320, our citizenship is in heaven. Every country has its own role of uh, citizens and the book of life, it speaks of the eternal and unspeakable blessedness that uh, attaches to faith in Christ and service for Christ. Let me say that again. The book of Christ speaks to us, explains or rather it uh, symbolizes 
the eternal and unspeakable blessedness that comes or that attaches to faith in Christ and service to Christ. So time is up. So God willing, we will continue from chapter 4 and verse 4, a well-known verse, perhaps the best known verse from the book of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. So what a good way to start off uh, tomorrow's study at 9 p.m. So I'm going to close in prayer. But before that, my usual announcement, we meet every night at uh, 9 o'clock in the night, Sri Lanka time to study God's word. And once we finish, I will upload it to my Facebook page. You can watch it again. Or if you have joined late, you can watch it. And uh, please join with me tomorrow evening as we go on this journey studying God's word. Thank you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we truly honor and praise your name, Father. Lord, there is none like you. You are an amazing God and you are an awesome God. Lord, we praise you and lift up your name because you are worthy of the praises of your people. You are worthy of the praises of the hosts of heaven, Father. Lord, we, our hearts are lifted up at this time as we have studied your word. Lord, it encourages us. It also has a therapeutic value. It heals us, Father. Thank you, Lord, for anointing us with your word today through your Holy Spirit. Lord, we continue to pray for victory over this dreaded unseen enemy, coronavirus. We pray and ask that we will be able to overcome this, Father. Yet, let it happen in your time, Father. And we pray for your protection upon us and upon our families. In Jesus' name, Amen. See you tomorrow night. God bless you.